I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11. Sometimes God speaks to us and we obey. Sometimes we don't. I had no idea what Billy was going to do, but you will be very surprised. Some of you, I'm not, but you'll be very surprised, some of you, that what he said is exactly what I had to share with you this morning. So, Billy, thank you for being obedient. God knows what he's doing. I have written down. And I wrote this this morning while I was over here. I give myself away. Right on top of my page. I give myself away. And I want to help you to understand this morning what the new year is going to be. And I want you to understand what it can be. And the choice is all yours. Billy said a while ago, now we've given it all away. Our life is no longer ours. And I agree with that. Except the catch is, once you give something away, you have to continuously give it away. Paul said, I die daily. It's not dying one time. It's not giving, oh, I gave my life to God. As soon as you walk out this door this morning, the enemy is going to be sitting there tempting you again. So we have to constantly this coming year give our life away to God every single moment of every single day. And that is a choice that you control. You give it away, got to take care of it. But the choice to give it is ours. And we're going to look at that. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, and their thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Father, I love you. I thank you for this church. I am so, so deeply honored to be a part of it. And I just pray that what you've already done this morning will be the beginning of a year like we've never seen in Kettle Creek. In each one of our lives, each one of our families. And that, God, you will use us in ways we can't even imagine today. And to God be the glory for it. In your name we pray. Amen. The children of Israel had been in bondage for 70 years. They got to where their life was more important than God's. God had told them that they should do away with all idols. And leader after leader, judge after judge, king after king, just continued to to deal with idolatry or to allow it to be continued. And God, in his infinite wisdom, he said, my children will not obey my voice. They are believing more in themselves than they are in me. They're trying to live their lives by themselves without me. They're playing games. I'm serious. And he says, my desire is for my children to worship me and me alone. Now, that's the same thing that's going on today. We don't serve idols like they did, but I will guarantee you we all have idols in our lives. And when we come to him, he simply says, I want you to give your life to me. And the only way that you can give your life to God is simply give it to him in everything that is pertinent in your life. And when it says give your life to God, that sounds easy. And we walk up here, and and I don't know what any of you prayed. I I have no idea. So many times we walk up here and we say, God, I give you my life. And we go back and sit down, and we don't have a clue what it means. How do you give your life to God? You say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins, and I want you to forgive me. And I want to live for you and thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I gave my life to God. Well, in a sense, you did. But it's what come next, comes next in your life. What do you actually give to him? 
What are the sins that you have, have in your life? What has this past year been to you? And what do you want this new year to be? He says, I give my life to you. And I, I was thinking over there a while ago when I was, I was thinking about it. I said, we got to give you my heart. So we say, God, I give you my heart. And we know that we can't take it out and give it to him. So what do we even say when we say, God, I give you my heart? Take the heart out and you die. And God wants us to die. Die to this world, die to ourselves, die to our desires. He wants us to give it all away. So we give him our heart. We got to give him our dreams. What do you want out of life? And, and I don't know that we'd be honest if we spoke it out loud, but, but in your own conscience right now, what are your dreams? What are your dreams for tomorrow, for this coming year? What, what are the dreams that you have for your family? What are the dreams that you have for this body that God's given you? What are your dreams? And we all have them. We don't call them dreams, some of us, but we all have dreams. I wish I could, or I want to, or I'm going to. That's a dream. It's not real. It's a dream. You're thinking of something that hasn't happened yet. We've got, we got to give him our dreams. We've got to give him our desires. What, what is your desire? What are some of your desires? I want to be popular. I want to make good grades. I want to find a good girlfriend, a good boyfriend. I want my wife to love me like she should. I want my husband to love me and, and appreciate me and think about me like he should. I want my children to be good. I want my preacher to get better. My desire is for this church to grow and to prosper. My desire is for God to teach our, help our choir to sing better songs. What is your desires? Make a lot of money? Be the prettiest thing on the earth? What are your desires? You have to give them to God. You have to give them up. That's hard for us because that's how we live. Our desires. My desire. And God says, no, you've got to give that up. It's hard to do that. You've got to give up your goals. You've got to give up your family. Now, we can do a lot of things, but when you start talking about family, you, you're getting out of bounds here. You know? no. you got to give it up. That don't mean you divorce them. It doesn't mean you ship them off somewhere. It doesn't mean you never talk to them again. It means that you give them up to God. And every one of these things I just jotted down there are things that we give up and we say, God, I know I'm still going to dream. I know I'm still going to have desires. I know I'm still going to have my family. I know I'm still going to have my heart. But God, what I'm saying to you this morning is I'm going to give up everything that I want for me. I'm going to push it off to the side, and I'm going to find out what you want for me, and I'm going to live what you want for me this year. And I know, God, that if I can live like you want me to live this year, you will take care of my hopes and my hearts and my dreams and my families and my wishes and everything else about me. Because Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his works and all of these other things he'll give unto you. So what are these other things? They're our heart that is pure and holy. They're our hopes and our dreams, our desires, our children, our jobs, our finances, everything else he will give us exactly what we need if we seek him first. And that is the message for this coming year, is learning how to put God first in our lives for this coming year. And how many of you are courageous enough? How many of you are brave enough to say simply this morning, as, as, as Billy worked, as God worked through him, how, how many of you this morning are willing to say, Lord, I give it up. I give myself away, and in that I want you to become first in my life. See, we say we will, but do we? It, serving God is more than words. It's actions. It's taking those actions and putting with, through them the words that you have said to God, the words that God has said to you, the promises and vows. It's putting them to work. Putting them to work. We don't have a problem in the world making New Year's resolutions. Re resolutions. <laughs> resolutions. We have a problem with keeping them, don't we? It's not saying them. 
We can say, I love you. <laughs> Cheap, I love you. But prove it by how you treat people. You see? So we've got to look at actions and try to figure out what God says here. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to develop an understanding. You let me get through this first point, and I'll, st I'll stop, and we'll do the rest of it tonight. The first thing that we have to do to be able to say to God, God, I'm going to give myself away. I'm going to receive and accept you. The first thing that we have to do is we have to learn what God wants for us. We have to learn who God is. And I wonder this morning if you could be questioned one by one and simply ask, who is God? What would you write down? What is God to you? And most of us would say the things we've heard other people say. That's not the question. What is God to you? Put away all the words, the fancy words, the pretty words. The, you know, put them all away. What is God to you? Well, he, he's my everything. Well, if he's your everything, why don't you treat him that way? We don't because he's not our everything. Those are words that we've learned to say. So, well, what is God to you? What do you think about God? How often do you please God and praise God for who he is and what he's done? See, we don't because we have simply learned to be able to praise God from the heart when things go good. We praise him from our head when things go bad. But we don't know the difference. Stephanie was talking, giving you the, the, the example this morning. God, do you want me to go to war? He said, no. I'll fight the battle for you. You just go ahead and start praising me. They were praising before the battle ever started. They didn't know how it was going to end. But they believed God's word. And a leader stepped up and said, let's do what is right. Let's begin to praise God. And in the midst of all of it, praise and honor and glory came from the heart for something that had not yet been seen, nor had it happened in reality. But in truth, it had already happened because God said so. You see? So praise come from a heart there, and God looked at that praise coming from the heart, and he delivered because the people obeyed him. Praise me. Now suppose that the king had said, oh, you know, just, just go back home and sit down and get your TV out and let's watch a little bit of that and you know, get on the computers and go to Facebook and play some on that. And while we're doing all that, God's going to take care of the battle. They would have lost everything they had. God said, I will, but here's what I want you to do. Do. And they begin to praise him. They begin to worship him. And when that praise and worship got up to heaven, God was pleased. And he arose from his rest and begin to do exactly what he said he was going to do. Do you understand that many of us have not received the blessings of God this year simply because we did not put God first in our lives? See? But what are we going to do about it? We've got to learn who God is. What does God desire for you? So I tell you, you tell me what God means to you. That's hard. But now, what does God desire from you? What is God's will for you? And we all, some of, you know, we, I don't know what God's will is. I'm just, I'm really seeking God's will. No, the Bible tells you what God's will is. Amen. You just got to look for it. He says in this verse, well, he told them, he said, these people have not worshipped me. They're continuing to dabble in sin. And I told them I don't want them to do it. This is God having a conversation with himself. I told them I don't want them to do it, but they're continuing to do it, so they won't listen to my word as I bless them. So I'm going to get them to listen to my word as I unbless them. That's a new word. It's a good one. Unbless them. So he says, I'm going to allow, I'm going to allow the Babylonian Empire come and to have a war with them, and I'm not going to fight the battle for them. We're going to let them see just how good they can do on their own. So the Babylon came, they fought them, and destroyed them. Beat their britches off. And then took every single one of them that was left in the captivity. Seventy years 
in captivity. Seventy years for them to wake up every single day and say, how did we get here? Then those begin to change into other things. Bitterness. Despising God. Questioning God. Rebellion. And eventually it turned into such sadness that they could not stand it. And God, in his infinite wisdom, looked at them every single day. And he said, it did not have to be like this. It was your choice. You told me you loved me, but you didn't live your heart. You didn't live it from your heart. You lived your heart, and your heart was evil. Your heart was rebellious. Your heart wanted things for you. You put you first in your heart, and you treated me like I was first, but I saw your heart, and I knew you weren't. And you kept doing those things you shouldn't do. At the same time, you were saying, I love you. Oh, God's good. God blessed me. God did this, and God did this. But you weren't living the life, and I knew your heart. So he said, I put you into captivity for 70 years. You would not praise me. You would not honor me. So I put you into captivity. But I promise you this. When I set you free, you will call me God. You will know that I am God. You will see that I was telling you the truth. So during that 70 years, what was God thinking about them? How can God do this? How could God let this happen in my life? I want to tell you, you can say the most negative thing you want to about God and your condition in life. But the one thing you better remember is what does God want from you? What has God done for you? What is God's will for your life? And God says this. I know, God speaking, I know my thoughts of you. I know what I'm thinking about you. And my thoughts for you, for you, this is what God wants, his will. My thoughts for you are of peace and not evil. So that you may achieve your expected end. Now look at that. God's will, I know God says my thoughts for you, what I want for you, and my thoughts are thoughts of peace. I want you to have peace, not evil, so that you can have your expected end. God says, I know that I love you. I know that in your rebellious state, when you were out there sinning and worshiping and doing everything I told you not to do, I know my thoughts towards you. I loved you then. I embraced you then. I loved you. And my thoughts are, not that I would wipe you off the earth and, and, and send you all to hell. My thoughts were for you to have peace. And God wants every one of us today to have peace. Peace. In the midst of their difficulties, in that midst of that 70 years, God's thoughts were for them to have peace. Now, how can they have peace? When they're in bondage, and God's let them alone, and everything's upside down, and everything's bad. How can you expect them to have peace? Oh, woe is me. Because he wants them to have him. And he is peace. See, we got to turn back. We got to give ourselves up. He said, I put you in that position so that for 70 years you could think about what you've done and then change your heart and change your mind and give it up back to me and walk away from who you are, accept me. And when you accept me in your worst condition, you'll have peace. You know why you'll have peace? Because you'll know I'm not thinking evil of you. And because I'm not thinking evil of you, I want you to have your expected end. What is your expected end? 
Can anybody in here tell me what your expected end is? Heaven. My expected end, I want to go to heaven. My end, I want to go to heaven. I want everything that God has prepared for me in heaven. And we say, oh, just think about it. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears. Oh, yeah. Because that's our expected end, is to get there where we don't have any of that stuff. And he says, I know what I'm thinking about you. My thoughts of you are for you to have peace and not evil, which is hell, for you to have peace, which is your expected end. I want you to have what you really desire, but you've got to learn to give your life to me if you want to receive what you really want. It's not playing games. People everywhere can say, yes, I love the Lord, and then go out and sin. Living, they're living in sin. What they expected end is not what they're going to get unless they give their heart and life to God and he forgives them, which he will. And he said the same thing to me and you. I don't care how many times we've done it. I, I don't care. You know, it doesn't matter any of that. God wants us to achieve our expected end. And our expected end is not to go to hell. None of us. We wouldn't be here today if that was true. We want to make it there. But the only way we can make it there is to have peace now in what we're going through. So think of, think of what this past year has been for you. Think about it. We've all been through some great trials and tribulations in this past year. Every single one of us. We've all th had things happen we didn't like because we didn't expect it. But they happened. We've all been sick. We've all had pain and sorrow. We've all had suffering. We've all had disappointments in life. We've all had everything that just seems like could go wrong, go wrong. I've had things happen to me this year that should never happen to a 35-year-old. Never. Should never happen to them. But they did. And they still are. <laughs> And I can be bitter at God, or I can be mad at God, and I can be upset at God. But God said, Danny, think about this. I know where you are. I know exactly what you're going through. I know every trial. I know every trial. I know every ache. I know every pain. I know everything you're facing. And my desire for you, Danny, is to know that my desire is for you to have peace. Not when I get to heaven. Peace today. That God control. That God has not left me. He is not mad at me. He, is not, he has not cast me away. He has not taken that fist and shaken it at me like that. God is reaching out to me today just like this and said, Danny, I love you, son. I know where you are. I know what's going on in your life. But I want you to rejoice. I want you to be happy because I've already taken care of that. All I want you to do is praise me. See, that's all he's saying. Some of the things I've lived through, I am blessed to be 56 years old. I'll tell you that right now. I am blessed. I should be dead. But somewhere along the way, God looked at me and said, Danny, I know what you're in. I, I know how long you're going to live, if you'll trust me. I know how long you're going to live. I know how many cars you're going to pass on the road that could wipe you out. I know all those things. But Danny, praise me. Just trust me today. I got it all under control if you'll just let me be your God. Put me first. Put yourself away. I, hey, I don't, my desire is to be able to walk and to be able to do all these things and just feel good and never have a pain, never have a sorrow. That's my desire. I got to give that up because that's not God's desire undoubtedly. It was, not, it was not their desire for them to go into captivity for 70 years. Their desire was to continue to live the way they were living, but God knew if they continued to live the way they were living, their end, they would never receive their expected or glorious end. They would wind up in hell somewhere for disobedience unto him. So he said, I want you to have the best in life, and the only way I can have it is to get your attention. Now he says to them, do I have your attention? And he says to me along the way, Danny, do I have your attention? And I think, well, Lord, I'm not sure. He said, Okay. <laughs> And then something else will come and something else will come. But all things work together for good to those who have put God first and are trusting God with their lives. Everything works. Everything works. And we've got to learn to put God first. It's, it's not what I want to eat. It's what God wants me to eat. It's not what I want to drink. It's what God wants me to drink. It's just that simple in life. But we don't ask him about those mundane things, do we? <laughs> 
Oh, that's not important. Really, if they're not important, then neither will the more important things be important in your life either. God wants us to trust him with everything. Do you know there was a time, not only that, that, that the king said, Lord, do you want me to go to battle? And he said, nope, I'll take care of it for you. Later on in his life, there was another time he said, God, do you want me to go to battle? He said, I sure do. See, we've we got to learn to trust God. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It's all up to God. Sometimes he requires us to do some things, sometimes he doesn't, but we've got to trust God. And in your life, you've got to look at this past year and be able to say, what things happened in this past life, this past year, that I regret that it ever happened to me? When did you get selfish to God and say, God, this, I should never be going through this. God, I want you to heal me this. I want you to heal me. And we pray for people that God wants you to heal them, and they die. God, why would you let them die? Because he's God. He's God. And we've got to learn that. He never makes a mistake. And wherever you are in life, you can lack $14 having 37 cents. You can have filthy rich riches. You can have the most glorious body. You can have the most ugliest body. You can be the smartest. You can be the dumbest. It makes no difference when you understand you are where you are and God sees where you are. And he says, my thoughts towards you are this, peace. I'm thinking peace in your life. I want you to accept me right where you are. We, we're trying to change everything about us because we're trying to live up to some image. And there is time that we need to just be us. Thank God I did not have any internet service, period. None. My phone didn't work. I thought, this is, this is good. This is good. None. I had none. Couldn't call anybody. I made the mistake of taking my iPad and all with me so I could sermon for this week. No internet. No Wi-Fi. You see? I didn't even take my Bible. I came back home yesterday and found it on the kitchen counter. I had carried it that far and put it down. At the last moment, I thought, I don't need that. I got my iPad. You see? And all this week, no, we turned the TV on Monday, watched that, and never turned it on again the rest of the week. I mean, I hadn't even heard the news. And I told that to Steph and Tish and Jack. I said, I, I haven't even, I, have, I, I do the news every day. No news, nothing. I was at what I consider to be almost perfect peace. That's what God wants from us. It doesn't matter about all these things we surround ourselves with. It doesn't matter how great we want to make this. God said, all you got to do is give it to me and let me take care of you. We've come so wrapped up with the things of this world that we don't know how to ask God for anything. We just throw up a Hail Mary every once in a while just to make sure the line's still open. And we're foolish because we don't know the line's been closed. He said 70 years. And then you'll come out. I believe our 70 years has happened in this past year. God's ready to bring us out. But he says the only way you're going to get out of here is for you to put everything down. And say, God, I don't know what you have planned for me, but I want it. I don't necessarily like what you're doing in my life, but I trust you with it. I'm not going to criticize. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to bellyache. I'm going to trust, God, that you know every pain in this body, that you know everything about me, and I trust you with my tomorrow. In Jesus' name. I know my thoughts for you. And they are thoughts of peace and not evil. So that you can have your expected, which means glorious, end. I don't know when my end's coming, but I can trust God with it. You got to lay it all down. I lay it all down. If you didn't come up here this morning and do this and do it right, you need to before you leave this building today. See, I know I may not live tomorrow. I know that. But I got to live like I know it. That means just trusting God with everything I am. 
everything I have for today, this moment, because I'm not promised another one. Lord, I, I lay my life down, my heart, my dreams, my desires, my everything about me. That was a bad year. Oh, you can pick out good things. Yeah, sure you can, but this is a bad year. But God, I know you brought me through it because you have something for me this year that is glorious. And I want to make sure that my final end is right, so I give it to you. I trust you with it. Can you say that this morning? Everybody stand with me. I'm going to close this morning. <clears throat> I want you to think about something. I know my thoughts towards you. They are thoughts of peace and not evil. So that you can have your expected end. That means God is looking at us today with our evil hearts all of our faults and failures that we've done. He said, in the midst of all those things, I want you to know that I love you like I've always loved you. I'm not mad at you because you sinned. I'm not mad at you because you did your thing and not mine. I'm not mad at you because you've disobeyed. I'm not mad at you. I love you. And my love is unconditional. You need to think for a second that Jesus loves you. All he wants to do is reach out and put his arms around you and pull you in. I want you to do this for me before I pray. I want you to turn to somebody next to you. And I'm dead serious and I would ask you to be this way for a moment. You turn to somebody next to you and I want you to grab them and hug them with a hug of love. I'm serious now. And I want you to understand that's how God is hugging you right now right where you are. Turn to somebody and love them. Don't talk. Don't talk. Don't talk. Just hug. It's hard for us to hug somebody without saying anything. It's just hard. And most of us, when we do it, we laugh. You notice that? Because we're ashamed, so we laugh it off. We don't want somebody to see us hugging a girl or hugging a boy. Or, you know, we laugh it off. Or else we give them a half hug, you know. But Jesus, when he hugs you, he does not laugh. He does not give you a haphazard hug. He just grabs you and he pulls you to him and he lets his hug do his talking. He loves you that much. He doesn't have to say, I love you. His hug is love. And whoever, whoever hugged you, if they did it right, you felt something today. And God says, I know my plans for you. Therefore, peace and not evil, so that you can have your desired end. And I am going to be hugging you the whole time, whether you do good or bad, I'm still loving you because I want you to make it to heaven. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your infinite love. It goes beyond our understanding. It goes beyond our ability to, to emulate it. It is a love that surpasses everything that we can ever imagine. 
And God, some of us have not felt your love in a long time. Well, we felt love. We love us when we get what we want. We love our life when we get what we want. We have just failed to see that what we want is not going to take us to our expected end. It's what you want. You want us to throw our hands up and just let you love us unconditionally. And for this coming year, I pray, God, that each of us will examine the past and realize that you didn't let anything happen to us in this past year that wasn't for our good. We just got to figure it out. Where we are right now is not a bad situation, no matter what it is, because you're in it. It's working for our good. It's working so that we can have the expected end that we want, a glorious end, a victorious end, a life in heaven. So, Father, bless us all today and help us to be able to choose and do right and say to God, be the glory above all things. Thank you for loving us and for not giving up on us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.